Advent and uh, how this affects Jesus because uh, the Lord of the Second Advent in Unification Church is not Jesus, it's another Messiah. And I think uh, most of the followers of uh, the Unification Church and Sun Young Moon would say that the Lord of the Second Advent is Sun Young Moon. This statement goes along with it. Sun Young Moon made this statement himself. In 1960, he married Hak Ja Han. Is that how you'd say that? And proclaimed it the marriage of the Lamb in reference to the Apostle John's vision in Revelation. For people that aren't familiar with that verse, here's the verse. The verse states, quote, let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. My question is, isn't Reverend Moon committing sacrilege by calling his marriage to one woman in 1960 the marriage of the Lamb? That's completely different than what Orthodox Christianity holds. Wouldn't you think, Tom? Well, if there is a remote possibility that Reverend Moon's marriage has a special place in history, then it would be his responsibility before God to convey to the world in the most understandable terms, uh, which is a very difficult topic, that he has a special mission to fulfill. Now I realize the, con the context here is the idea that the kingdom of God is coming on the earth, that this is the last days and it's about to occur that the channel by which it's going to occur is going to be through the creation of what is called true families, and that the Messiah's role in the latter days is going to be to establish that model of a true family. I realize that's all new, and I only pray that you be, be, be prayerful and thoughtful before you decide whether it's in or out of okay. what's true. Okay, I, so, I appreciate you being so intimate and caring about what you're saying, and we respect your beliefs. And so, uh, Dr. Martin, can you gently respond to that? Thank you, Dr. Martin. I know that's a little rugged, but try it. <laughs> We're becoming uh, friends. This, uh, is, this, this, this night itself is history. So. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Uh, his marriage feast is the church, which is his body, mm -hmm. which is totally <clears throat> removed from the concept of Mr. Moon marrying the lady in 1960. Totally removed from it. Secondly, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, according to biblical theology, will return, and he will return personally and visibly. The Apostle Paul says, the Lord Jesus himself shall return out of heaven with the shout of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Not Mr. Moon, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, since we are dealing with Christ as the Redeemer, and the marriage in Revelation talks about Christ and the church, there is no possibility that you can in any way put Mr. Moon in Revelation. Mr. Moon is definitely not the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. One issue that we haven't talked about in the entire series here mm -hmm. is the most important issue which TV interviewers rarely get into in the divine principle thought. And that is the beginning of the whole book deals with the principle of creation. In the principle of creation, the single most important element of our theology, long before we even deal with the ministry of Jesus and the second advent, is the original purpose of God's creation. The original purpose of God's creation was not that mankind be created and fall, but the original purpose was that Adam and Eve obey the commandment and achieve the ideal of love on earth as a true family. We're all for families, mm -hmm. and we're all for them being uh, underneath the Lord God, mm -hmm. but their being underneath the Lord God comes about completely different than what unification theology is teaching. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so where concept, do we go from there? The concept of the family in traditional Christian thought is different than that in unification thought. The point that we've got to deal with here as, as Christian thinkers or as religious thinkers is how, what happened at the fall? What was the problem? And we can't deal with what the problem was unless we understand what the ideal should have been. That's what I feel. People have got to think and pray and study what Reverend Moon is teaching because yes, it's I, powerful. I, I think it's that, important. Yes, I think that and you're absolutely true. convinced that Reverend Moon's rendition of the fall mm -hmm. is true. That's, I think, what is in question. Is it true? And then secondly, the remedy to the fall is completely different than Orthodox Christianity. For example, let me ask you a question off of one of his own quotes. Uh, 
There's no sin that Father cannot forgive. This is not his quote. This is a teaching coming out of uh, the 120-day 120 120 day manual, manual, which is not While an official I was, publication of the church. But you teach it to your missionaries and everybody that comes through that at the is, seminary. Th that is one evangelist in the Unification Church sharing I've got, a sermon. So I've got some more make here that for distinction. you. That's not right let's let's just speaking. finish it up. You don't deny that while you were committing sin, Father was shedding blood to cleanse my sin. Because he shed blood, he was qualified to give life to me. Do you deny that statement? What do you mean by that statement? Namely, that Moon was shedding his blood for the, to free people from their sins? What that meant was that during the time when Reverend Moon began his mission, he went through a tremendous amount of persecution, three years of that in a North Korean prison camp. To us, that internment in that prison camp had a very special meaning. When someone says they shed their blood, it doesn't necessarily refer to a physical shedding of blood, but it has to do with an attitude of life, that the, the whole purpose of life is to live like God, like Jesus, which is selfless. The essence of the fall is selfish love. Okay. Therefore, the return to that question of the fall in answer to Reverend Moon's mission, in my heart and mind, Reverend Moon is showing an example. You can call him the Messiah or not. That's immaterial. The key question is that he's showing an example of selfless love in the individual, family, national, and world level, that is something we've got to look at. I'll, I'm, okay, I have another one minute left here. Dr. Martin, come back after this here. Page 16, the Master speaks on prayer in the spirit world. Moon himself said, I have paid a great amount of indemnity, and because of this, I have the right to forgive another's sin. Mm -hmm. Dr. Martin, concerning the fact of you got the uh, these things that Moon, forgiving sin, his blood being shed, the marriage supper of the Lamb, uh, all of these things that are taking Christian words, it seems like they're being taken out of context, which becomes what we started the program with, what Paul said was another gospel. What would you say concerning these things of forgiving sin and uh, paying a great amount of indemnity? Is he taking Jesus Christ's place? Well, yes, very definitely, because Jesus Christ made one sacrifice for sin forever and sat down at the right hand of God, and that finished it. What you're seeing here is a direct violation of logical thought. A cannot be non-A. You learn that basically in logic. What we're getting here is a redefinition of terminology so that A ends up non-A. Every time it's pointed out, Mr. Moon denies the Trinity. Mr. Moon denies the deity of Jesus Christ. Mr. Moon denies salvation only by grace for man as a whole entity, that is the spirit as well as the body in the resurrection. Mr. Moon denies the fall classically and, and substitutes for it Eve having sex with Satan or with Lucifer before he became Satan. He denies the second advent and makes himself the Lord of the second advent. Now, what we're getting is typical cultic changing of terms the scaling of the language barriers, I said, in the kingdom of the cults, in which unless you understand what the words mean, you'll never be able to carry on a dialogue or understand what Tom is talking about because his vocabulary is totally removed from the vocabulary of Christianity. Therefore, when he says that Christianity gave birth to the Unification Church, the Unification Church is an extension of Christianity, can't be an extension of Christianity because it's another gospel and denies hey, Christianity. Ten seconds more. Wrap it up. That's one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is that the Unification Church is amplifying those terms, that we have to grow into a new view of what those terms mean. Okay. Let's, I'm anxious to see what the audience here would have in terms of questions. And if you'll join us, we're going to start with questions from the audience to this group of men next week. Thank you. Welcome. We're talking about the beliefs of the Unification Church, and we have representatives from Sun Young's Moon's Church, uh, the Unification Church. First, uh, Thomas Cutts, the Southeast Regional Coordinator for the Unification Church. Reverend Tom McDivitt, primary.